Okay, welcome uh, everybody. It's uh, half past uh, one, I think, so it's uh, time to start. A uh, very uh, warm welcome for uh, Hugh uh, Lovell. He was on a conference in uh, Switzerland on uh, biological uh, dynamic farming. Uh, last week he was in Ireland. Uh, they had a lot of snow in Ireland, so he couldn't uh, make it up uh, Saturday. But we are uh, very glad that he is today uh, with us. Uh, this morning we had a lecture already, and we have uh, you are the second uh, the second group. What I hope to do today is to help people, you might say, get on the path. Like, how are we going to get to the point to where we've got it working? Because we're inventing a new agriculture. Something that's not taught in the schools. Something that's not really written down in many books. And we don't have neighbors that are doing it. It isn't like there's, everybody knows how to do it. But we're inventing something new. And we're gonna make a lot of mistakes and we sure don't know what we're doing nearly well enough. Even though we may know some of the broad, broad outlines of things, we have got to, everyone has got a different situation different conditions, different weather, soils, all the rest of that. And so as a method, we don't have a method that we can just say, oh, this is what you do. There's no recipe that's really a reliable recipe. We're inventing a new agriculture. So I think maybe I'm supposed to use no. this can Is leave, it going to pick leave, up well leave. enough? Yeah, it's, it's enough. Oh, okay, great. So, this is a presentation here that I prepared specially for this. Ag Changing Agriculture, Part 1, a 2018 Netherlands course. And I'm Hugh Lowell. Now, Changing Agriculture has some difficulties. And the hardest part is changing your mindset. You can change, once you change your mindset, then you can change the things around you with accuracy and you know what you're doing. But you've got to realize that you are the problem. I know we point to other things and we blame other things that they're the problem, but really what's under, what is, what is the problem is us. And there's obstacles in the way. We're running into obstacles. There's obstacles at every turn. And one of the big obstacles is the blame game. Mm -hmm. Anytime you blame something else, you're saying, I don't have any power. This is the ticket to helplessness. As long as you blame other things or other people or whatever other conditions or what, whatever you've got, if you blame them, then you're saying, I'm helpless. Now, some of the popular excuses, and I say popular because I hear them frequently. I hear people say, you can't do that. When I started farming, the guy who milled my grain to make flour, because I started the bread business, to cash flow my farm. So I'd go to the flea markets and I'd sell bread and I'd buy tools and I always had money. So it was cash flow. But the guy who milled my wheat said, you can't grow corn organically, he said. Me and my dad tried it. And you just can't do it. Well, I told him, I don't care. You, it has to be done. In other words, I don't have any excuses. It's going to end up being done if I have anything to do with it. <coughs> don't know how. 
Well, lots of things we don't know how to do, so we have to find out how. Don't let that be an excuse. Sure you don't know how. So you have to get your head around it and find out and try things, and don't let that be an excuse. There's not enough time. This is another common excuse. You know, and the world is getting faster paced all the time, and we don't have enough time. I see farmers that are working 14, 16 hours a day, and they don't have enough time. There's not enough money. I can't do that. There's not enough money. I can't afford it, and so on and so forth. Well, if we knew what we had as resources, like 98, sorry, 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and we're spending a lot of money on it. It's free. Every farm has it in terrific abundance. You never run out. But you haven't found out yet how to tap into it. Nature on the wild taps into it. What's going on? Why can't we do that? So, not enough money isn't a very good excuse. It's too risky. I'll lose my farm, I'll lose my crop. You know, it's, it's like these bugs, I have to spray for them because they might overwhelm everything and then I would have nothing. And that's, that's really another excuse. It's just luck. I know that France over here is doing it, you know. I've gone over, I've passed by his farm, I can see he's growing things very, very vigorously, but is he just a lucky farmer? You know, it always rains on his patch, but it doesn't rain on mine. Or, you know, he's lucky because he got good soil. He inherited a good farm. You know, it's like, it's just luck. There's a lack of will. We don't have the determination to find out what we need to know. And that's an excuse. We don't, we, we can't do it. It's just too hard, you know? We can't find a way. It's just, I, you know, I'd do it if I could, but I can't because I can't find a way to do it. Well, I want to affirm that, yes, you can. And it's not really too hard. It's difficult, though. You have to overcome these obstacles, and they're obstacles in your mind. You have to change your mindset. So you'll have to learn to, how to learn. Okay, this is a big step. They don't teach you this in school. You're a good learner, well, then you go to the head of the class. But if you don't know how to learn, then you go to the bottom of the class. Well, there's something to know about this. When your attention wanders and your understanding fails, then you need to find that point where you last understood what was going on and find out what was the trigger that set you off. Because that will be an obstacle to learning. Study is not a process of repetition. It's not a process where you memorize things. Study is a process of removing the obstacles to learning. Study is when you go back over it and you find where you missed it the last time and you get that understood. You might use the dictionary a lot, you know? But there's something there that you didn't understand and that's an obstacle to learning. One of the things that's a big issue is concepts come before perception. Our Australian Aboriginals couldn't see the first sailing ships that arrived with the Europeans because they had no concept of such a thing. What, what they saw out there on the horizon and the ocean didn't make any sense. 
so they couldn't see it. They, they went, their, their ocean voyages were in canoes without riggers. A big wooden ship with these big canvas things didn't make any sense. They couldn't see it. They didn't have any concept for it. Four-leaf clovers. I found out I could find four-leaf clovers, and once I got a really good concept of what they looked like and how to find distinguish them between three-leaf clovers, then I started four, five, six, even seven-leaf clovers. So it's like, oh, I had to have the idea first. Until I had the idea, the concept, I couldn't see them. And I was looking at them all my life. Might be you too. See, do you, do you see four-leaf clovers when you're walking through the pasture? I do. Well, it's funny, on the field, when I take the example, yep. I find regular, uh, very often four-leaf uh, clovers. My nephew asked me, are there also five-leaf clovers in the world? I said, I never know. I don't know. I never found one. <laughs> we went to the field. I mean, I found one. I have a picture on the bottom yeah. of it. And I yeah. found about five-leaf clover. Yeah, they do exist, I can yeah. tell you. I've never found an eight-leaf. Somebody <laughs> told me I found an eight-leaf, so there must be some. But anyway, the concepts <laughs> have to come before the perception. You have to have the idea before you have the experience. This is really true in surveying what your actual resources are. Guess what? 98% of every human organism, every plant, animal, microbe in the soil is made out of elements that come from the atmosphere. Everybody wanted to find out about soil. And we'll get to soil, I think. But first, we need to understand what's going on with the atmosphere because that's 98% of what we're made of. Our bodies are made of, you know? Your body is, we're carbon-based life forms, let's face it. Every life form on Earth that, it, that I know about is based on carbon. And hydrogen, water, is essential for life. It's like the fountain of life. And so you got hydrogen and oxygen. And nitrogen, the basis of all our DNA, our reproduction, all the rest of this sort of stuff, our protein chemistry, is nitrogen. And we have to have a little bit of sulfur as a catalyst for this. So there's sulfur-containing amino acids in our cell walls and connective tissues. And so we actually have those resources. They're not scarce. So what's going on with them? How come we are not making better use of them? So to see what our natural resources are, guess what? Silicon is the basis of cell walls, connective tissues, and transport vessels. And it's 50% or more than any, in every, sorry, every soil. So this soil, the clay, is aluminum silicate. Sand is silica. It's abundant. Did you ever test for it? Let me tell you it's abundant, but its availability is low. It's like the nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it's practically inert. We're never going to run out of it, but it's essential for plants to take up nutrients. It's essential for their, for their cell walls, their connective tissues, the things that protect them from invasion or, you know, pests and diseases. That's silica. It's abundant. Do you know anything about getting access to it? This is your actual resource. But you don't have a concept for it, you're not going to see it. In game theory, the big deal is optimizing your options. You want to maximize your opportunities. That means it doesn't matter what game you're playing. You play chess and you want to control more of the board. You play backgammon, you same thing. 
you play cards, and you're always making your own luck when you give yourself more options. Then it doesn't matter what happens, it works for you. You want to seize your opportunities, but of course you have to recognize they're there and that they're opportunities. I tell people occasionally, this is a dangerous statement for me to make because people switch off. But I tell them, oh, I love insects and diseases because they tell me what I'm doing wrong. Whoops, they're the messenger. And I'm shooting the messenger? We do. Yeah, we do, that's right, herbicides. We're killing the messenger. We're, we're killing the messenger. Yeah. Well, they're telling us what's wrong. Yeah, well, it's an opportunity. We should be listening to the messenger. You know, we're not learning from our learning opportunities. I know an insect eating your plant, the first impulse I have is to squash the insect. You know, I don't want worms in my cabbages. So my first impulse is to kill it, get rid of it. But I have to wonder, why is it there? I was catching cabbage worms in my cabbage patch in Australia. Every day I was getting 12, 14, 16 cabbage worms on my cabbages. And finally, it took me a little while, and I thought, what the heck is going on that I've always got cabbage worms? And a little voice answers me inside, you know. And it said, you talk to everybody about silica. Why don't you talk to yourself about silica? You know? It's like, you idiot. Oh, oh, silica. And then I dusted it all down with diatomaceous earth and stirred up biodynamic corn silica and sprayed everything down. And the next day I found one cabbage worm. I didn't find any other cabbage worms for over a month. It's like I just started working with the silica. That was what was wrong. I didn't have high bricks cabbage. I didn't have enough silica in the cell walls and connective tissues. The worms found it very easy lunch. You get enough silica and your cell walls and connective tissues, you can't rub it to where it rolls up. And then the worm tries to eat it. Well then, it takes a bite and whoops, there's a long chain amino acids here I don't know how to digest. And it's a real hard chew. You know, things go away when you've got the right conditions. So, you need to learn to seize your opportunities. There's a lot more of them out there. I mean, your prayers are answered, but you pass it by because the answer doesn't make sense to you. The buck stops with you. You're responsible for your life and your activity. You're the one that tells yourself to get out of bed in the morning. You know? It's, you're responsible for what you do and what you learn. And if you've got issues that you have to learn something, you're responsible to do that job. You are your final authority. Let me tell you, my father raised me to question authority. And that's a dangerous thing to do, you know. We had, in South Louisiana, we never had snow, we never had ice, that kind of thing on the roads. Until this one winter, there's such an Arctic blast came down out of Canada that we had, we would have had like four degrees minus Celsius. And we had an inch of snow on the ground. It was like, oh, amazing. You know, people went out and built snowmen. They did that in Ireland last week. You know, there was a shortage of carrots in Ireland because people were making snowmen. <laughs> they don't usually get snow there, see? So, so we kids found out that we could spray the driveway down and the walks. We could spray them down and then like super slide, you know? And we were having a lot of fun. My mother came out with the laundry to hang it on the line and she slipped and fell and she told dad, 
you know, the kids are like icing up the sidewalk. And so dad come out and he said, that's enough of that, you know. We'll have no more of that. And so for about an hour or an hour and a half, we didn't do it. But it was our only chance ever. We didn't expect to ever see it happen again. So we got back into doing that. And then dad caught us. And he said, go in the bathroom and wait. He had a razor strop. This is in the old days. And so he, you know, he'd take care of his own emotional thing, and he'd administer punishment. And I said, but Dad, you know, you told me that rules are made to be broken. And he said, not this rule, and not this time. <laughs> but it's still... If you question authority, if you question what you're told, you might find out that it was an error that you were told. What you were taught in school, much of that, look, I got white hair, so a lot of what I was taught in school has turned out to be false. It's turned out to be wrong. I was taught a lot of things in school that just weren't so, and I'm sure you were too. Everybody in this room was taught things in school, especially if you went to ag college. Taught things that were just not true. Nitrogen is nitrogen. Doesn't matter what form you put it on the soil, it's just nitrogen. That's not true. It makes a big difference how the plant takes up its nitrogen. I mean, an enormous difference. So you have to question these beliefs, the things you were taught. You have to question authority. <clears throat> you are your final authority. You need to know the truth and be able to tell the truth. That doesn't mean you go down the street telling the truth to everybody that you pass by, you know. It doesn't mean that you re reveal other people's secrets. But you need to be able to tell the truth. And if you can't tell it, well then you can't really tell me that you know it. You need to keep an open mind. An open mind's a dangerous thing. It'll get you in trouble. But it's how you learn. With an open mind, you will encounter new concepts, and then you will see things differently. Whoops, this thing goes mile wild sometimes. You want to know what your essential beliefs are. Is this belief necessary to understand what's going on? And you could write it down. You could say, oh, this is what I believe. You know, something that you could actually state. And you need to question these beliefs. Our biggest obstacles to learning are our beliefs. The mind involuntarily rejects information that's contrary to its beliefs. I don't know who was the first person who said that, but it's big deal in information the uh, uh, theory that the mind involuntarily, it does it automatically, it rejects information that's contrary to its beliefs. So you need to examine your beliefs or you won't be able to pick up on information that you might need. And this thing jumps. Know your assumptions. You need to understand what your assumptions are. Let me tell you something. I'm a scientist. And science is based on assumptions. So is religion. Science is a religion. It's a belief system. It just denies that it's a religion. But it's based on assumptions just like any other religion. <coughs> It just oftentimes ignores the spirit side of things. There could be a science of the spirit as well as the science of matter, you know? So you need to know your assumptions and you need to question your assumptions. Seek and you will find. If you don't seek, you don't find. 
If you're not looking for information, look, I can't go around and tell farmers these things when they don't listen. It's when they ask for it, when they seek the information, like you people came here today, and that's the kind of people I talk to. There's no sense in talking to them, anybody that's not listening. I could just, just as well beat my head against the stone wall because then I'd quit pretty quick. Ask and you will receive. If you don't ask, you don't receive. Knock and the door will open. You have to keep at it. You have to go for it. You have to actually, like, look for, to put the doorway to the information that you want is, and then you can enter and find out these things. So until you knock, then the door doesn't open. Observation is the basis of intelligence. You know, all your IQ tests are based on your powers of observation. They're not based on language skill. They're, you know, they're based on your powers of observation. Observation is the basis of intelligence. So if you learn to be a better observer, then you would get a higher IQ test score. How about that? You can raise your IQ. You know, did you take an IQ test once and it said you were stupid? <laughs> I've done that. And I've also taken an IQ test that said I was genius. And I don't know if I believe either one. It's just when I'm observant, I'm intelligent. The CIA is the, is the central <coughs> intelligence agency. It's a spy agency that wants to find out hidden information. You know? That's the basis of intelligence. Memory is not the problem. You know, we say, oh, I can't remember that. Somebody will come along and say, oh, you remember that time we went out water skiing or whatever it was? And no. No, I've gone out water skiing, but I don't remember that time. And they say, oh, well, that was that day in July that, you know, and, and we had a group of us. And you, you remember that girl? Oh, yeah, now I remember. Because I took real interest in that girl, okay? So this was the cue to my memory. My memory was there. The problem was recall. You know, what are the cues? What's the address system to your memory? And if you cross-index your address system, then you will improve your memory. Because the problem's not the memory, the problem is recall. Diversity and cooperation are nature's strategy. You see in wild, like, environments that build fertility, that they have a lot of diversity both plant and animal life, and microbial life. So diversity and cooperation is nature's strategy. There's something called synergy. Synergy is when two or more things are working together and producing a joint sum that's greater than their sums taken separately. We're monocropping. We're trying to keep every weed, every other plant, whatever, out of our barley fields. If we planted lupins in the barley fields, then we'd get both lupins and barley. But the lupins are activating the lime because they're drawing oxygen into the soil and their root exudates are a pH down around 3.5. So they unlock lime. But the barley is really great at making sugar. It's a C4 plant. So it's real effective at making sugar. You go out in the winter and pinch some of that barley and chew it, and what is it? It's sweet as all get out. It's like candy. And cows love it too, because it's like candy. Well, okay. 
they're producing the energy for the nitrogen fixation, and the, and the lupin is producing the lime that's met, needed. Between the two of them, they'll get more growth for both of them. They're doing two different jobs. One of them isn't doing the other job. To plant them together, look, you harvest it with the harvester, and you just screen out the lupins. They're high protein, incidentally. And if the crop residues that you leave behind, if you were an earthworm and you had to live off of nothing but barley, then how good a life would that be? It's like having beans in your barley soup. You know, I grew up in South Louisiana and we ate rice and red beans. It was like the meal in Louisiana. You know, every restaurant served red beans and rice. It's cheap. Look, you could go to Buster Homes down in the French Quarter, and for 32 cents, and 2 cents was taxed, and 30 cents for a plate of red beans and rice. That was a few years back. But, but it was like, it was the cheapest meal in New Orleans. So diversity and cooperation are nature's strategies. But for human beings, Uniformity and competition seem to be our strategies. We think, we think we all have to be the same. You know, we put on, we have games. We put on uniforms. And then we have competing teams. And so we compete. What kind of games do we have to enhance our cooperation? What's our culture based on? Our cultural values our uniformity and competition. We put people in wars as soldiers and they wear uniforms. And talk about competition, boy is that competition. You know, we're at war with nature. We're using all sorts of, of destructive things because we're waging war with nature. We're in competition with nature. Guess who wins? Nature has infinite resources and infinite patience. It's been really patient with us. But in the end, if we don't start working with nature, it's going to stop working. You can produce so much more biologically than you can chemically if you know how to work with nature. And that caveat is really important. You have to know how. You have to know how nature works. If you're not succeeding, and exceedingly well, I might add, and this gentleman over here tells me he wants to be an Olympic farmer, you know, to set the records. I love that, because you can only set the highest records with biological methods. The top corn producer in the United States in 2017 was David Hula, who's a corn farmer in Virginia out towards the East Coast. And 242 bushels, these were 30 kilo bushels. A bushel is a volume measure. So you can have 24 kilo bushels, and you can have, you know, 29 kilo bushels. You can have 30 kilo bushels, that's the highest. He had the highest bushel weight in his bushels. 242 bushels to the acre. And an acre, it takes two and a half acres to make a hectare. So he's producing like this huge amount of maize per acre. And he thinks he can go a whole lot higher. He's a no-till farmer doing biological. But he thinks he can go a whole lot higher because some areas in his field, the yield monitor is down around under 400 bushels, and some of them it's up way over 600 bushels, and he thinks he can hit 700 bushels if he gets it right. That's a lot of maize. I bet you don't know anybody in Holland that's doing that, but it would be interesting to shoot for those goals. That's Olympic farming. So 
we need to change our strategy. Now, where the attention goes, the energy flows. This is basic quantum mechanics. Werner Hasenberg won the Nobel Prize in 1932 for proving that the, that the presence of the observer and his or her measuring instruments is a determining factor in the field of investigation. That means that everything is indeterminate until an observer observes it and determines what the phenomenon is. Look, he proved this with scientific experiments. So this was a thing that previously the belief in human culture was the observer didn't have any effect on the phenomenon and it was completely independent of him. And that was the old Cartesian notion. But Heisenberg proved that the presence of the observer and his or her measuring instruments is a determining factor in the field of investigation. And he wrote his treatise on the principle of indeterminacy. So this is fundamental to modern science. Where the attention goes, the energy flows. Manage for what you want. Okay, because your attention will be on what you want. Okay? Don't try to manage what you don't want. Because your attention will be on what you don't want. And then you're going to get what you don't want. What you resist, you will get. You know? Because you're, you're not only thinking of what, of what your hopes are, you're thinking of what your fears are. And if you focus on your fears, that's what you'll get. If you focus on your desires, your hopes, then you'll get your hopes. You know, you're not going to be an Olympic farmer unless you strive for that. It isn't an accident, you know. Origins. Where does life come from? Well, that's a good question. So here's part two. Maybe we can go right on into it. We haven't taken too much time, have we? Does anyone need a break? Or? Okay, so here's part two of Changing Agriculture, 2018 Evans course. And we're dealing with what's the prime mover? You know, in religion, then people say, oh, it's the creator. In science, they say, well, what's the prime mover? You know, what started it all off? So it's just different language. But it means the same thing. What started all this off? Where did it come from? What's the origin? So this character, Werner Heisenberg, he proved that the observer and the phenomenon are inseparably linked. And this assumes the act of observation determines the phenomenon. Here's another uh, person that's very influential in quantum physics, uh, John Bell. He published his uh, Bell's Theorem in 1955. That was the year that Einstein died. You know, Einstein didn't like quantum physics. He called it spooky action at a distance. Because two linked particles could be separated by light years, but you flip the spin on one of them, and it'll flip on instantaneously on the other one. Quantum non-locality is saying that two entangled objects, will they're linked. They're entangled. It's a holographic universe. And two entangled particles are in, they're instantaneously responsive to what happens to one happens to the other. Well, yeah, you can look at it as that, but it's like waves, you know, the speed of light is the limiting factor in relativity theory. 
So it takes light years and years to travel, even from Alpha Centauri, it's four and a, a fraction of light years away. So it's like light is traveling at this really slow speed, whereas instantaneous connection, there was an Apollo astronaut, I'm trying to think of his name, but he was a physicist. And when they went to the moon, he had practice with a counterpart at Houston Ground Control to do experiments with using Rhine cards. These were Rhine cards used in telepathic experiments. And Dr. Rhine at Duke University in North Carolina pioneered this back in the early 20th century. So he took the Rhine cards to the moon, his counterpart at Houston Ground Control, their, their telemetry on their mission, like was keeping track of what time it was. Because you know, radio signals take a second and a half to arrive from the moon or to get to the moon. So there's that time lag because of the speed of light. But in his telepathic experiments, then it was instantaneous. He flipped the card and see it, and his counterpart would check the check sheet. And so every time he turned a flip the card, say here's the next card, and turn it over, and his counterpart at Houston Ground Control could check the they practiced this and checked the check sheet and it didn't take a second and a half at all. It was just a matter of, you know, from turning the card to checking the box. It didn't take a second and a half. It's virtually instantaneous. And that experiment was one of the proofs of quantum entanglement. So Rudolf Steiner, now, probably some of you have heard of Rudolf Steiner, and you may have heard of biodynamic agriculture, at least, and that's one of the initiatives that Rudolf Steiner uh, got started. So we have to look at this. What do you believe is the prime mover? Do you believe that consciousness arises from matter? Or do you believe that matter arises from consciousness? Which belief do you prefer? Which one is more comfortable to you? And why is it comfortable? Many people believe that there is a creator. There's some spiritual, like, source. And that we, to some extent, are co-creators with the original creator. And quantum physics says that the phenomenon is dependent on the observer. So would you be comfortable if you think that matter arises from consciousness? Because that certainly was Rudolf Steiner's take on things. Let's look at this. Order arises out of chaos. Order is the basis of organization, and organization is the basis of life. And we're organisms, we're organized, we have organs, etc. So living organisms are like organized. Erwin Schrodinger in his biophysics lectures in Dublin in 1948 made the statement that living organisms have the remarkable ability to concentrate a stream of order on themselves and thus to defy the second law of thermodynamics, which basically is the law of entropy. It's saying that everything is running down into chaos. Now, that's a remarkable idea, and physicists really believe that everything is running down into chaos for the most part. Most physicists believe this. Erwin Schrodinger was rather an exception, exception. But if there was a Big Bang, 
and things, everything like blew apart like that. Well, how come we have so much order in the universe? We have galaxies and galactic clusters, and we have stellar systems, planets. We have, look at the organization on the Earth out there. It's extraordinary. All the life on the Earth, it's highly organized. So, you're going to tell me that that everything is running down into chaos and we've got that kind of order out there? It's really peculiar. People compartmentalize their belief, you know. And they think, oh yes, entropy rules everything. And then they believe in evolution. Huh? You mean it runs up into greater complexity? In evolution, but you believe it's all running down into chaos? How do you reconcile those two beliefs? You know, do you even examine those two beliefs? Well, there happens to be a mathematical function that develops order out of chaos. So, This is called the golden mean. Phi is 1.61803, but it's a non-repeating decimal like pi, and it's called an irrational number because it can't be reduced to a finite ratio. It's going to go on and on and repeat. It never repeat itself. It's based on the Fibonacci series, which starts off with adding the, the next number is made out of the number before it and the number before that. So zero plus one is equal to one. One plus one is equal to two. Two plus one is equal to three. Three plus two is equal to five. Five plus three is eight. And five plus eight is 13. And eight plus 13 is 21 and so forth. And very rapidly it gets into high numbers and then you can take the farther number, like this out here, 481, and divide it by 2,584, uh, 2, and you get essentially 1.61803. But if you go backwards and you divide 2,584 2, by 4,181, then you get 0 0.61803. It's the only self-similar number in mathematics. And it's, that's where organization arises. That's the growth curve of a whole lot of living organisms. No, they also call that the uh, relationship between female energy and male energy, where you're trying to strive for 62% female energy 32, where you get this perfect uh, symphony, this perfect uh, harmony. Well, that sounds really interesting. I haven't, I haven't thought about it. We call it the Hulbus native for holding in Dutch. Yeah. It's where you're looking for female yin and yang, but the female needs to be stronger than the male. And it's at 62, at 38 percent. Well, that's interesting. Uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was a scientist as well as a poet and whatnot. He was the inspector of mines in the Republic of Weimar. Or Weimar? I'm not sure how it's spelled. Uh, but in any event, he studied in going down in the mines, he studied the geology. He studied all sorts of biology. He wrote a treatise called The Metamorphosis of Plants. And it was a treatise about how every plant does certain things. It's like the way that plants go through their process of life from seed to seed. It's really brilliant. So he wanted to know what are the driving forces in nature? What are nature's wellsprings? And in the mineral realm, he found this was polarity. But in the organic realm, he found it was enhancement. Organisms like to grow. They like to multiply. They like to evolve. 
It's a natural process in the living realm. So I use this uh, fractal image there to represent that. But here's another fractal for you. Benoit Mandelbrot found, working in IBM as a mathematician, he found that when he graphed the points in this simple equation, z is equal to z squared plus c, that he got this picture. Now, nobody could do this before the age of computers. He was working for IBM. But once he had the computing power to graph that many points, this is what emerged. And it's a remarkably complex figure. And it arises by defining boundaries. This, this equation defines boundaries. And you can magnify any point in this and find that there's greater complexity that you can't see in the startup. But in any, if you magnify any point, it's incredibly complex. And human organisms are like that. We're, we're based on fractal geometry. So what does this mean for us? Hydrogen, out of all the elements in the periodic table, is the purest expression of this phi principle. So it's working. Hydrogen, you could say, is where the consciousness coalesces into matter. Matter is bound energy. You could say matter is bound spirit. And why is that possible? See, hydrogen, as a lone proton, spinning away like it is, it's like a small needle. You look at it end on, it's just a point. But it's associated with the electron shroud of the universe. So with hydrogen bonding, it can switch electrons wherever. Now, it has the most boundary because it's a point with the electron shroud. So it's got infinitesimal content, but it has infinite context. So here you see the difference between content and context. This is in a geometry textbook. And, whoops, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Content is just like taking Euclid's equation for generating the circumference of a circle. It's 2 pi r. That's equal to the circumference. So it's twice the radius, in other words, the diameter, times pi. So that's the way of defining a center, I mean the circle from its center, from its content. But there's another way to look at this. In projective geometry, we know that we can define this circle by rotating a line that's going to the infinity in both directions. We can rotate that line around the circumference, and then we're defining the circle by its context. Well, guess what? The context is where the information is. It makes no sense. The circle has no meaning until it's related to the context. The context informs the form. The context is informing the content. And with living organisms, this was in that same geometry text, this is the, the center forces. You know, engineers have to work with centripetal and centrifugal force. The physicists say, oh, well, there's only gravity. But the engineers have to work with 
centripetal force. This is centripetal force here. This is centrifugal force there. And centripetal force, the force of condensation, the force of precipitation, is the lime forces. Limestone is precipitated out of the ocean and it forms sheets on the horizontal. But silica, which is what pushes up high mountains and comes out of volcanoes as volcanic ash and is working with the periphery, it's working with those forces of levity. You know, Sir Isaac Newton described very, very nicely how the apple falls from the tree. But he didn't say anything about how it got up there. But obviously it did get up there before it fell from the tree. So life is levitational. I mean, this is good humor, this is having fun. You know, levity. With this in our language. Gravity is what happens when the body dies and you put it in the grave. So these forces are at work in plants and in animals. Silica and lime forces. And they, have, they engage in a dynamic interplay. So here you've got your lime forces in the soil and your silica forces in the atmosphere. And they get together and then they develop a dynamic interplay between what goes on above ground and what goes on below. Well, photosynthesis goes on above ground. It's not a soil process. You know? Blossoming, fruiting, and ripening are all atmospheric processes. They don't happen in the soil. But what happens in the soil is mineral release and nitrogen fixation and digestion and nutrient uptake. Oh, those are soil processes. They are very different from the atmospheric processes. The atmospheric processes are working with levitation and the soil processes are working with gravitation. So the silica processes are working like this, like in a maize plant. And the lime processes are working like this. They form limestone sheets and it precipitates out on the ocean bottom. But in plants, you have to have both that up and down energy because the, the plant is photosynthesizing. But then at night, when the sun goes down, that relaxes the tension in the plant. And then it leaks down. Its root exudates out of its root system. And that feeds the biology of the soil. The biology of the soil, the bacteria and fungi, are elaborating nutrients and the protozoa are eating them and releasing those nutrients in freshly digested form around the plant's roots. And that's the plant's digestive system. It's outside of the plant. The plant is getting its nitrogen actually from processes that are occurring in its environment, but not within the plant. Yes? More question. How would the system work? I don't know so much about Scandinavia, even though my 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 Swedish grandparents came from Scandinavia. But in Saskatchewan, the beekeepers, the bees are out flying nearly the whole day, and they just stack the supers up in their sweet clover fields. And they make a lot of honey in the summer. I mean, the bees are out there working, and sweet clover is producing nectar the whole time. Uh, during the night, or is this dark? Well, the, the it's plant feeds the, the soil. Yeah, the plant feeds the soil at night. So do I have 24 hours uh, uh, light in Scandinavia? Yeah, Perhaps but mind, mind you, though, when the sun is high, it's really sucking on the soil hard. And then what it has sucked up, if it's sucked up good enough, then when it goes down towards the horizon, it's already starting to let down its root exudates. So even if it just goes down and goes around the horizon, 
and then comes back up again, then it's still releasing root exudates and still photosynthesizing. You know, if you sit in a cornfield, a maize field, and let the sun go down, you can hear the maize growing before the sun has set. Okay, nitrogen only works at night, you know. I tell people that's why it's called nitrogen, but there's other stories about how it got its name. But it really only works at night, you know, the growth process is a nitrogen process. Okay? It has to grow before it, you know, ripens or anything like that. Ripening occurs in the atmosphere by day, but your growth processes are happening in the soil by night and happening in the plant by night. So you're growing a zucchini, and all day it sits there, it's this long. Then it goes through the night, and tomorrow morning it's this long because it's growing at night. Watch this. The growth processes are all occurring at night, and they're nitrogen processes. So nitrogen is working at night. You know, in the daytime, the, nit the nitrogen in the atmosphere is transparent. It aligns itself with the sun's rays, and it doesn't do anything. It's like, it just, it, it's all oriented like this. It doesn't have the ability to break out of that organization. But at night it does, and nitrogen, even though it's taken up by the plant in the daytime, it's not doing anything until the sun's going down. Observation. You know, you can go make the observations <laughs> yourself. You might not have observed it, though, because you didn't have a concept. But, you know, cucumbers, squash, all those sorts of things, they grow overnight. Watermelon, doesn't matter what it is. All of these things grow in the night. I don't understand. Huh? I, I don't understand. Really. Well, go out and watch and think about it. It's a greenhouse where it's 24 hours light. Yeah. Oh, so they're artificially lighting and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I don't know how much light they get out of those artificial lights, but there has to be some like, like some darkness within the plant for the nitrogen to work. It's the biophilic, biophilic uh, clock that's in the plant, probably. That, so we also during light. In, in well, there's energy, a certain amount you can trick the biological clock. You know, you keep the lights on in the chicken house in the winter because then the chickens eat more feed and they gain weight faster and that sort of thing. So you can trick it to a certain point, but I'm not so convinced that you can trick it entirely and just have all of it, you know, working on the sunshine and nothing working back down. <coughs> I'm pretty sure that most houses. of these greenhouses must yeah. turn the lights yeah. off some of the time. Well, if they don't, they got some missing information anyway that is in the sun and not in those artificial lights. Well, they can't totally replicate the energy from the sun anyway. Look, in America, the marijuana growers grow their marijuana in cellars and whatnot, and they have a lot of light arrays. But they turn them on and they turn them off. In fact, that's how sometimes they are spotted. They're found out by authorities because of the surge in electricity, because it takes a lot of electricity to run all those lights. But they're growing them in, look, they want to keep it as dark as possible because, you know, they don't want to be discovered. And there's a lot of money in it. This is a further example of how these lime and silica forces are working in plants. So, this just shows you some of the geometry of plants. 
Now, Rudolf Steiner, who I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, developed what he called anthroposophy, or literally translated, this is the study of human wisdom, anthroposophy. And he's the original originator of biodynamics. His agriculture course was his last major uh, lecture cycle. And in this agriculture course, he proposes that there are four levels, the physical, like the elements, which are largely disorganized. There's a certain amount of organization of minerals, like certain minerals travel to certain places and collect. And so things do get organized, but on a very broad way, it's like there's organization in the universe, but it's not, it's not in, internalized by any living organisms. In plants, however, they internalize this organization. So the etheric is internalized in plants. The etheric is essentially the vibrational activity of everything in the universe. Everything is vibrating. So it has an energetic vibration. You know, the background warmth in the universe is 2.7 degrees Kelvin. But the plants internalize this vibratory energy and it's organizational. It's what holds a hydrogen atom bound. It's what's, it's what's keeping the hydrogen atom a hydrogen atom. It's what's keeping every element in the universe as a bound element. Matter is bound because it's organized. It's organized energy. Okay? So somewhere along in here I have a diagram of a hydrogen atom as its energetic waveform. But it's like that picture that we looked at, which is also a picture of hydrogen, and it's a picture of phi. But plants internalize this. Organizational energy flows from lower concentration to higher concentration. Whereas this organizational energy flows from higher concentration to lower concentration. You stick your plug in the wall and the energy is, ends up dispersing. But plants collect the energy and build it up within their organism. You know, that's one of the things that photosynthesis is all about. But that's not the only organizational activity in a plant. A plant has chemistry going on, but there's also warmth and light that are, that are essential to the plant. And then there's the life in the soil, and that's really essential to the plant too. And when we're down there at 1% organic matter, we don't have much life in the soil left. And it doesn't feed plants very well. So really your etheric levels are warmth, light, these are condensed from the you know, the radiant state of matter, then the gaseous state, we're talking about light, light travels through the, it's a perfect medium for traveling light, the air is, but it's not, water's not a very good medium for that. Water doesn't penetrate, light doesn't penetrate water very well at all. So what penetrates water though, and it's a perfect medium for its transmission, is tone. Whales in the ocean can hear other whales a thousand miles away and know who they are. But then life, when we get down into the carbon in the soil, then the life forms in the soil are like fully organized. So they're about as densely organized at that level of anything. So you've got those levels of organization and those are all etheric like uh, types of etheric energy. Warmth, light, tone, and life. And that corresponds with fire, air, water, and earth. 
those are the elements. But the ethers are warmth, light, tone, and life. Now, this is out of Rudolf Steiner. So he's looking at this, and animals are getting their nitrogen from a process of digestion that's occurring within the animals. So the animals internalize their nitrogen process. Plants are getting their nitrogen from a digestive activity that's occurring around the plant, so they don't internalize the nitrogen process. And the nitrogen process, nitrogen is the carrier of what Steiner called the astrality. Now he was going back to an earlier age, maybe to say, uh, the Vedic times, and that's the way it was called then, was the astrality. Our astral body, you know, separates, our nitrogen body separates and goes traveling at night, mm -hmm. and our dreams are our adventures in the astral. Mm -hmm. But, and we call that astral traveling. So that's what he's talking about. When I read his agriculture course, I didn't know any of that. And I thought, what's astral? So I looked it up in the dictionary. And it said, of or pertaining to the neighborhood of stars. And boy, I wasn't any the wiser. And I read that book. I'd come in for lunch, fix myself a sandwich, sit down on the couch, try to read another page in the agriculture course and wake up with the sandwich on the floor. It was the most mind-numbing thing that I could find. Man, cure for insomnia. I went to bed with it. If I couldn't sleep, I grabbed that book, and boy, I'd, go, I'd wake up with the lights on. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. Like, like I didn't make, need to take any drugs to go to sleep, that's for sure. <laughs> so, the astrality though to get back on the subject animals internalize that and so animals have this awareness astrality is all about awareness about sensation and desire you know an amoeba comes along it's moving around it moves real fast in the soil if you look at it under a microscope but anyway it's moving around and it's saying, oh, don't like that, don't like that. I think I'll have this. It's sensation and desire. People do the same thing. They move around, they say, oh, man, I don't like turnips. You know, but I really like apples. So I'll have the apple, I won't have the turnip. You know, so you take it in and you digest it and you're getting the nitrogen chemistry from within your body. You've internalized it. So that astral process, it gives rise to nerves and gives rise to consciousness and gives rise to sensation and desire. Animals internalize it. And that's what Steiner was talking about with the astrality. So awareness is the big deal with animals. And cows are very aware. She's in there real and if you've ever, like, scooped out the brains from a cow's skull, there's a lot of brains there. Not quite as much as human, but geez, they're really, they, they've got brains. But they don't have an awareness of being aware. They're only trying to be cows. They're not even aware they're cows. They're part of the herd, you know, everything in nature around them is part of them. But human beings, with their bony formation around their brain that's really dense, then they are aware of being aware. Mm -hmm. They've internalized their awareness of their awareness. So from that point of view, they're egoic. They have egos. And well, Donald, Donald Trump has a very, like, underdeveloped ego because he has to keep bragging about himself to convince himself he's somebody. 
And unfortunately, he convinces a lot of other people in the process. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody beat their own drum all the time? You know, self-praise is no praise. So that's when you don't know that you're somebody and you're trying to convince yourself. You know, that's, that's, that's underdeveloped ego. People who are self-secure, they know who they are and what they're doing, then they don't need to brag about it. They don't need to make false promises. They don't need to tell lies. And they've overcome shame. They experience shame. People, everybody experiences shame once in a while. But you're dealing with it. You're transforming yourself. Human beings do this. Cows don't transform themselves. It's just humans that do that. Humans get a farm and they transform the farm. You know, that's what ego is about. Self-transformation. So, these formative forces are what living organisms are made of. And 98% of it's coming from the atmosphere. That's the hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And the other 2% comes from the soil. Now, I don't mean to say the soil is unimportant. It's just we don't understand what these elements are doing. The soil is what anchors them. You know, the plant is growing out of the soil, but actually its mineral content is just a small percentage of what it's, you know, what it's made of. But it is important because it's heavy, it anchors the plant and all the rest of those sorts of things. The, the silica is structure and the calcium is the protein. It's working with the, with the nitrogen. So, do I dare go on to another little, this will be a short one I think. And we may need to take a break. I haven't seen anyone get up to go to the toilet yet. Here's what hydrogen is doing. Hydrogen is the basis of origins, originality. It's, and this is very important for the ego because the ego is originating things. When you transform your farm into something more than what it was, then this is an egoic process. And hydrogen is the basis of that originality. All the originality in the universe is based on hydrogen. It's the vehicle for inspiration and the vehicle for memory. And this is what it looks like at the energetic level. It's primary uh, color is red. So this, when you look at the spectrum of hydrogen, it looks like it's red, but it's got all of these more rarefied colors around it. And these are what is the resonant levels of the electron, you know, the electron orbitals. So it's there, it jumps from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, and it doesn't go across the distance in between because it's only going, the electron's only going to exist where its wavelength reinforces itself. So there's very specific lines in the hydrogen spectrum. Okay, you can look up the bright line, you know, uh, spectrum of hydrogen. <coughs> it, uh, it is uh, influenced by the magnetic field. Well, maybe it influences the magnetic fields too, you know. But it's, the magnetic fields are based on spin. Electric fields are based on charge. And charge and spin interact in what we call electromagnetics. But charge is a polarity, spin is a polarity, and nuclear energy is an in and out polarity. And you can't tell a plant, you can't fool a plant about which way is up and which way is down. It's responding to those forces of levity and gravity. So, 
Hydrogen, the first substance, the spinning proton emits the electron shroud. So it's minimizing its content and maximizing its context. So if life arises at boundaries, it's got the most boundaries for the content of anything in the universe. So you might say it's the fountain of life. <coughs> It's the basis of growth and the means by which the universe is expanding in every direction. So we focused in science on gravity and entropy, but there would be no universe without levity and syntropy. So it's the basis of organization. Now what about oxygen? Oxygen is the carrier of the ether that warmth activity is, well, I called it the universal vibratory activity. It's also the basis of acidity in chemistry. You know Lavoisier, well actually John Priestley discovered this gas that he produced by electrolysis of water and he showed it to Antoine Lavoisier. And Lavoisier said, voila, we have found the basis of acidity in chemistry. And he named it oxy, oxygen, because oxy in Greek meant acid. The Germans found out about this, and they called it Sauerstoff, because it's the basis of acidity. You know, the same concept. They just used German. So, oxygen is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And we are looking at things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, in our soil tests, and we're treating them as though they were pure elements. We treat iron as though it was a pure element. What's going on there? Yeah, but you get the next and then it's closed. So anyway, what's going on is we all see the oxides of things. That's what's really happening in our soils. And in an anaerobic soil, guess what? There's plenty of oxygen. And if it's waterlogged, there's the oxygen in the water. And all of the minerals are oxides. But it's just short of free oxygen. You know, with something like a radion instrument here, you can broadcast the pattern of hydrogen peroxide out into a waterlogged field. This might be important in Holland. You can broadcast the pattern of hydrogen peroxide and you'll get free oxygen in the soil out there when you do that. And then you will have life recover in an anaerobic condition. You know, a waterlogged soil, it's, it goes under water, right? And it goes under water for a month or something like that, and then how do you revitalize it? It takes a little while for the biology to recover from that. It takes a lot less time if you broadcast hydrogen peroxide for a couple of days out there. Huh? What? Well, this radionic instrument, you know the, the universe is much more of a dance or a song than it is a building or a machine. Okay? Everything is vibrating out there. Everything is etheric to some degree. Plants are just more etheric because they've internalized the ethers. Animals, of course, have internalized both the ethers, ethers and the awareness and desire. And then humans go a step further and they internalize this awareness of awareness. But everything is vibrating out there. You take a sheet of metal, put it on a pin, so you know, some mount, and you scatter sand on it. 
you've probably seen this experiment, you take a tuning fork and you strike it so it vibrates and touch the steel plate with it. And the sand grains will dance into a pattern. That pattern will be whatever the frequency of that tuning fork is. You get a tuning fork of a different frequency and you get a different pattern. Mm -hmm. If you put the pattern of hydrogen peroxide out there, then you will get the oxygen in the soil. You don't have to put the oxygen there, it's there. You will get the oxygen to turn into free oxygen. Not a whole lot of it, but just enough. Only do it for a couple days and you will oxygenate the soil. And all of those aerobic organisms will come back to life. Because you're putting the pattern out there. You know, I can put the pattern out there with a map. This is the map of my farm in Georgia. See, I've drawn the boundaries around it, and I've written an intent on the map. If it be thy will that the powers of nature converge to increase and enhance beneficial energies and transform any detrimental energies into beneficial ones within the boundaries as marked for now and in the future, for as long as is appropriate, in deep gratitude, amen. This is a thought form. I've written my thought down, and it's on a sheet of paper, and it's a thought form. So it's stable. My thoughts are going all over the place all the time. So my thoughts are working rather rapidly, and I can't keep my focus on it like I can if I write the intention down on a piece of paper. So I'm broadcasting that pattern along with the pattern of the property, and it's entangled with the actual farm in Georgia. So it doesn't matter that I'm here in Holland. I can put this in the well and turn on my instrument, and I can broadcast whatever patterns I put here on the cards or in the wells to the property, the map, and it's quantum entangled with my farm. It's instantaneously like linked with my farm. So, wow, sure makes it easy to change the patterns on your farm. If you want to have something like this instrument, this is radionics, and I use it to put biodynamic preparations out, and I can do it every morning and every evening. In the morning before breakfast, I'll set it up and set the timer on it, and you let it go. And I'll go out and work the farm all day, and I'll see what's going on on the farm, and I'll think, oh, I need to treat it with this or that or the other pattern for in the evening. I come in before supper, I set up another treatment, turn the timer on, and it'll turn itself off. You only use it biodynamic preparations, or do you have different information you can supply to your Oh, place? yeah, well, I just mentioned hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, you mentioned hydrogen you know? peroxide, so you don't, it's not limited to BD. No, no, but it's, it's the cheapest, most effective way I yeah. know of practicing BD, because you can put it out there every day, you know, morning and evening, and you just put the pattern on, you don't use anything up. Hydrogen peroxide, you have to put the materials out there? Yeah, I mean, I put the, because I don't have a card for hydrogen peroxide, I'll put the hydrogen vial of hydrogen peroxide in the well and broadcast that pattern. Because the ask, well will pick up the pattern of anything. It might may, be may a I pattern of you lime to your field. Maybe your lime in your field, if you look on your soil test and do a total test, yeah. a test that is a, uh, an acid digest, a total acid digest of the soil using aqua regia, which is a concentrated solution of hydrochloric and nitric acid. And it will reveal things that you didn't know were there in your soil. Most of the phosphorus might be locked up in your soil. It is our case. We've yeah. got all our calcium huh? and phosphorus locked up. Yeah, well, the calcium level would be locked up with the phosphorus. Yeah, absolutely. And it may be because of copper shortage or something else like that, it isn't going to it isn't gonna have, release. Yeah, the cows are telling me we have a copper shortage. Yeah, That's and the then, then you're going to have a phosphorus shortage because phosphorus doesn't work without That's copper. Right. So, so cows, could you put like um, 
uh, the, the sulfate, uh, the copper sulfate in you that. You put the copper sulfate in the in instrument projector? and project the pattern of copper sulfate yeah. to the field. And just yes, a few grains would be enough. Of well, the copper sulfate. Uh, you go out and see the farm the next day, and maybe it's not enough. So you come back the next evening, you do it again. But when you see the signs in the farm, look, the sign in clover in the winter is it gets reddish yeah. tinge to the leaves. That's copper shortage. I wouldn't believe that that is phosphorus shortage, not in Holland. No, we've got massive calcium there's, and phosphorus. There's but plenty we, we've of got phosphorus all there. Locked up. But it's not working, and it won't be working because of copper in the winter, because yeah. in the winter, copper works 100 times less well than it does in the summer. Mm -hmm. So when you see those cows get a, that, that red scruffy streak down their I back, the it's in the winter. The yeah. yeah, and I put copper sulfate in the drinking water now. Yeah, but ever it's... So little, ever so little. Just yeah, to get you the have to be real careful there. because, boy, you can overdo it. No, but just just that, because all you need is the information out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, the information would help a lot because you'd still have copper in those soils, but the copper isn't working either. Correct. And if you use sea minerals in your soil drench, then you'll get copper in the sea minerals anyway. So you might not have to put what it on. What do you the sea drench? Uh, sea mineral soil drench. Uh, sea crop? Yeah, not sea crop, maybe. I'm not sure what you call your product. Yeah, it's the ocean solution, but... Uh, yeah, well, well this is the I one that has the sorry. sodium chloride taken out. Yeah. yeah. Maynard Murray's story about sea minerals, and he put sea water on his soils, and he started getting less and less beneficial results because it had too much sodium chloride in yeah. the seawater. Well, we so you have to remove the, the salt, yeah. and you evaporate to 90% evaporation, and then you start to get other minerals that will precipitate all of your magnesium, your sulfates, your potassium, all of those other minerals start to precipitate. Sea minerals, like what he's selling, is about 8% sulfur. It's about 3% magnesium. And so, guess what? If you take magnesium sulfate, it will really loosen up whatever's happening in your bowels. So if you sulfate. take, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, let's say you have, what's it called that you, 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 you don't like uh, go to the toilet and it, it doesn't want to come out. It's, it's constipation. You have constipation, so you take magnesium sulfate, Epsom salts. Don't take too much, man, because it's powerful. Uh, oh, and you, and you will get really loose. <laughs> There's a few other things that in seawater that'll make you lose. One of them is it has a whole lot of boron in it. Yeah. And I don't advise this. I don't advise like taking a teaspoon of soluble. You know, boron is powerful. It's a trace element. But boy, it'll sure make you lose too. Does it? Does your um radionic device, does it project on the animals or just on your Yeah, farm? no, 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 it projects on your animals, <coughs> anything on your farm that's on the map. So it's going so to project it. Your family so, is living on your domain? Yeah, well, the same. well, I, I thought, I'm looking at my alfalfa, my lucerne, and it shows signs of boron deficiency. It's hollow stem, it gets limp in the middle of the day and that sort of stuff. So I thought, well, I'll fix that. I've got a radionic instrument and I will project solubore, you know, disodium octoborate tetrahydrate. I'll, do, I'll broadcast that to the farm. So I put my farm map in and I put solubore in there and treated it with the pattern of solubore. Well then the next day, I happened to notice that the rabbits had rather mushy rabbit pellets. And the day after that, they were even looser. It was really pretty mushy. And by the third day, look, I was going to the toilet a lot faster too. You know, I came out, the rabbits were like liquid manure. 
That's not a rabbit thing. That's really unusual. <coughs> they didn't appear to be sick or anything, but they had liquid manure. Well, I had had liquid manure for about five times that morning. And I'm sitting on the front porch, and I look out across the creek, and the cow coughs. And sploosh, it went about eight feet in back of the cow. Boy, talk about liquid manure. And, <laughs> and I thought, what the bloody hell is going on? And a little voice inside my head says, you are broadcasting solubor to your whole farm, and you've been doing it for three days. Man, I could hardly get there fast enough and turn it off. And I went out to look at my lucerne, and it's showing signs of boron toxicity. I was too. <laughs> you know? So when you actually use your device, you really need to know what you're doing. You yeah, you really do. Total holistic approach mm. to absolutely. It's no quick fix. Well, it could be a quick could fix, be. but it isn't. It certainly isn't the final, only, and total solution to all the problems yeah. of existence. You know, we're always looking for that, the magic bullet yeah. that well, fixes yeah. everything. <laughs> you know. Well, sorry, but radionics <laughs> doesn't qualify. You can do yourself as much damage as you do good if you're not careful. With this system. Huh? Yeah. With this system. With that system, with the radionics system. What I understand is every element has its own frequency. Frequency, yeah, everything and does. The, the frequency you bring in, in, in your, your broadcaster, uh, 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 and that covers the frequency. And this frequency is going through an area of, 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 of his... It'll go over everything on the map. In the map? Why is the map? Well, because it's quantum entangled with the actual farm property. You know, I downloaded it from Google Earth. It's not hard to do. Then I drew those lines around it with one of my computer programs, and I printed the map. And that's what I use as the witness for my farm. It treat the whole farm. You can only so I'm really careful about property. what I do with you it now. You can only your own property here with it. You can't go to the buurman. So you have to go to your own property. What is that then when you buy a drilling copy and you have to go to that field. That is the information that he puts in that pot. Right there. That is the information that he gives with the intention. So that you can only do it for yourself. Because you don't want to be influenced by others. En dan heeft hij feitelijk eerst het gewoon die tuning van waar hij het over heeft. Hij tingde die en daarmee stuurt hij die informatie feitelijk over jou. Want ik, ik snap niet dat jij trilling zo uh, precies kan sturen naar een bepaald gebied. Ja. How can you send vibration to a position? Ja, ja dus ik zeg ook een houtje. Quantum non-locality and entanglement. Hmm. This is quantum physics. This is an application of quantum Natuurwet. physics. Het is een natuurwet. Ja. Hier moet je dus alles wat je op school hebt geleerd afleggen. Ja, ja. 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 Dat begon je verhaal maar zeggen. Ik luister naar je broer wel eens. Nee, maar voor die fantom gebeuren, hè? Ja. Just, yeah. You start your story with, okay, you have to unlearn a lot of stuff you learned in high school. So well, yeah, the, I guess you do. So this is the quantum stuff that you now have to... Yeah, yeah well, you know, we call you know, our company quantum agriculture because we're applying quantum physics to agriculture. Why not? You have to look at the way order of perception. Yeah. Oh, it's really cheap and easy. Yeah. You don't have to buy a whole lot if you have a radionic instrument. You have to buy the instrument. But you have to learn to read your farm in totally other way. Oh, yeah. Well, but nature is an open but book but if we know how to read it. But how do you send, you have hmm. more crops? You are not monopoling. How, how do you send them? Because every crop, well, oh, the elements are okay. and, and uh, Nee, but every crop has a other vibration. Yeah, well I was growing high yield corn. Now my flour mill guy said, oh you can't grow corn organically. And I said, I don't care, it has to be done. And when I found out how, then I was growing high yield corn with soybeans. It was interplanted with soybeans. soybeans. Yeah. Because that's the balance between what's, you know, they're synergistic, so I had synergy going. 
I was growing that without any nitrogen fertilizer and getting top quality corn. Now, I was doing this and selling it at the markets as cornmeal, and people would buy a winter supply because they knew they wouldn't get it. They wouldn't see me at the market for the rest of the year. And I wouldn't be back there until the spring. So they would buy their winter supply on my last market days and put it in their freezer. But they couldn't get such good cornmeal anywhere else. Your end plants, the corn would be short. Yeah, with the soy. So ten different crops in the six hot flame blow on. Yeah, look, I never planted winter wheat without planting crimson clover and and some other things too, like turnips and daikon radishes and things like that. And the one that I really want to have in my cereals is Rapunzel. You know, Rapunzel, the French call it mache. Uh, the English call it corn salad. It's a bean. Uh, it's Valeriana locusta. It's an annual winter weed. Gets up about this high, and it blooms before anything else in the spring, and makes its seeds. So if you don't use glyphosate, you probably have it in your grain fields. It used to be in all the grain fields. It was called corn salad because in English barley was corn, and. This was the early spring salad. You go out and pick the top tips of it, about this much. And it was a terrific salad, beautiful salad. And it was a cure for infertility. You know the story about Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair? It's a Grimm's fairy tale. Well, this old couple, that they were getting old, and the old lady was having hot flashes, and they had never had any kids. And so they kind of had to give up on that, you know. Didn't have anything passed down their legacy to or anything. So the old lady had been pestering the old man for years because the witch that lived nearby grew corn salad in her garden. But she had a reputation for turning invaders into marble statues. So it kind of kept the invaders out of her garden. But she had some marble statues there, so maybe there was something to that idea. And so people were scared off. Well, finally, the old man thinks, ah, what am I living for, you know? If the old lady wants corn salad, then it doesn't matter, you know, if the witch turns me into a marble statue. But I'll sneak off into the witch's garden and pinch a little, you know, a little Rapunzel and put it in my hat and carry it back home and give the old lady, a, you know, a treat. <clears throat> so he goes off and slips into the witch's garden and the witch catches him. Boy, is she an observant type. So she says, hey, Buster, don't get your knickers in a knot, you know, we could make a deal. And he says, a deal? The witch says, yeah, yeah, I'll make you a deal. You give me your firstborn child, and you can come back every morning and get all the corn salad you want. Oh, wow, what a deal. The old lady, is, she's, she's like in menopause. She's not going to have any kids anyway. So he says, okay, let's shake on it. So, okay, the witch says, I'm going to hold you to it. And he thinks, you know, this dizzy old bat doesn't know what she's talking about. The old lady isn't going to have any kids. So he goes off in the witch's garden and gets a hat full of, of corn salad every day. And the old lady pigs out on it, and she is like in ecstasy. But then, next thing they know, she's got a bun in the oven. She's knocked up. You know, that phosphorus in that plant, man, it warms you up. Talk about reproductive activity. So they kind of forgot about the witch. But she shows up at childbirth, and she snatches the child and goes off and raises it in a tower. 
And the only way in and out of the tower, you know, is Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And this prince wanders along, and he sees this witch doing this, and he thinks, wow, what is this? So he waits till the witch wanders off, and he goes down up there and says, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. So then he climbs up, and oh, wow, you know, they have a love affair, and the witch catches him, and casts him out of the tower into the briar bushes that scratches out his eyes. And there's more to the story, but you get the picture that Rapunzel, which is the German name for corn salad, is the herbal remedy for infertility. So, anyway, that's, that's the story. Uh, we were actually talking about oxygen here. <laughs> uh, and oxygen is, like I say, the basis of acidity, and all chemical reactions are oxidation reduction reactions. So the hydrogen side is the reduction side, and the oxygen side is the oxidation side. So when oxygen's bound, it's the vehicle for etheric activity. So in plants, this is the basis, it's the carrier of the etheric activity. And plants actually give off oxygen because of photosynthesis. What about carbon? Carbon is the structural element. It's the framework for life chemistry. So you've always got this carbon skeleton to all the different chemistry, the, you know, the chemistry of life. And so carbon is structural. And when we turn something into charcoal, like we turn wood into charcoal, we leave the structure behind and we've chased off all the oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and sulfur. So carbon is left behind. It's the framework. And we're all carbon-based life forms. So as diamond, which is pure carbon and compressed to a fairly well, uh, it still will burn up. Like if, you, if your jewelry gets caught in a house fire, then the diamonds will all turn into carbon dioxide. Don't expect to find your engagement ring if you left it in the house when it caught on fire. So, but carbon manifests all the cosmic imaginations. Rudolf Steiner called carbon the great plastician that manifests all the cosmic imaginations. Every conceivable organic form is based on carbon. Coal was deposited in an earlier age of life on the Earth, when, according to our Australian Aborigines, the Earth was covered in jelly. Rudolf Steiner tells us this was the age before the moon separated from the Earth, and living organisms then had to have lime as part of their structure. And the lime is what draws in the nitrogen out of the atmosphere, the cation complex, of which calcium is the principal element. So, in an earlier age of the Earth, the life forms in that time, which, according to traditions, were like jelly. They deposited this carbon, and this became the basis of coal. And after the moon separated from the Earth, I don't know if you're aware, but this is common scientific belief today, is the moon is made out of the Earth. It's separated from the Earth. Analysis of moon rocks shows they have the same chemical makeup as the Earth's crust. The Earth itself gave birth to the moon. And when it did so, then it entered the age of limestone, and lime became essential in living organisms. And coal doesn't have much lime in it. It has a very slight amount of lime in it. 
but many coal seams are buried under a limestone like cap. So many of our coal mines are that presently, you know the most efficient way to mine coal these days is not to drill around underground. That takes too many people and it's too dangerous. So they blast the limestone and they break it aside and then they, with big shovels, they dig up the coal. And boy, do we have coal mines like that in Australia. You would be amazed. Well, the strip mining in Australia is awesome. But in West Virginia, it's called mountaintop removal. They push the limestone off into the river, and then they mine the coal. And it's ecologically really like, it's, it's savage. It's really brutal. This is a hell of a way to treat the earth. But, and it, <laughs> what do you think it does to the rivers? Anyway, that coal was actually deposited by living organisms. Just not the kind of living organisms we see in the world today. With sugarcane, sugarcane is one of the best plants to catch carbon. Only, unfortunately, in our sugar production, the standard of producing sugar has been to cut the cane off and haul it to a big sugar mill and squeeze the juice out and cook it down into sugar and then throw the bagasse away. They burn it for generating electricity or, you know, whatever. But it doesn't go back to the field. The only <coughs> cane farmers I know that return their own bagasse to their own field are the Judas Brothers down in New Iberia, Louisiana. And they're organic sugarcane farmers. And guess what? There is so much bagasse, their big problem is digesting it all. They have to have better animal activity digested in the field. So, wow. But they're building soil at a, at a rate that surpasses just about any other method. Talk about earthworms eating sugarcane bagasse, and what comes out the end of the earthworm is humified. Wow, what a great process. You can really build carbon into your soil. Life, complexity. Now what about nitrogen? Nitrogen is the basis of sensation and desire. And cows, boy, do they have nitrogen inside. Milk is full of protein, etc. And they are very aware. Nitrogen holds the patterns of our DNA and the chemistry of plant and animal reproduction. And where it's found, it's the vehicle of the astrality. And then, last of all, of the five sisters that are coming from the atmosphere is sulfur. Sulfur is the catalyst. It works on the surfaces and edges of things. This plant that you see here, yarrow, Achillea milfolium, look at how much boundary there is in the leaf. There's an amazing amount of boundary in the leaf of this plant. It's a real super sulfur plant. And in animals, then this is where you find the sulfur in a chicken. You find it in the feathers. And look at all the boundaries in the feathers. Sulfur is working on boundaries. Rudolf Steiner said that sulfur is what the spirit moistens its fingers with to work into the physical. Now he was, amongst other things, was a sculptor. And in clay, you've got a bowl of water and you dip your fingers in it to work into the clay. It makes the clay work a lot better. But sulfur is what works water. It combines with hydrogen and oxygen. It's really beautiful what it does. And it works into the chemistry of living organisms. In the chemistry lab, when I was taking chemistry, I was making a Grignard reagent. It's a notoriously hard uh, reaction to start. 
It's an organic reaction. And so the professor walking around, he says, oh, did you forget to put a drop of sulfuric acid in it? Because the reaction notes that SO4, which is sulfuric acid, basically, that SO4 is a catalyst. So I put a drop of sulfuric acid in it, and voila, it started to work. It's one of these reactions that once it starts, it'll go all the way to the end. But it's kind of hard to start, so it needs a catalyst. In organic chemistry, the two classic catalysts are warmth and sulfur, sulfuric acid. So this is what sulfur does in our chemistry. We need a fair amount of it. So what you see here in this rice field is you actually see sulfur deficiency. This is where the sulfur leached out of the soil. And so there's a failure to get magnesium in the rice there, and it's stunted and it's pale. Doesn't have enough chlorophyll. You can see that in fields. You go up, drive down the road, and you see, oh, well, there sure are sulfur deficient over there. Because you can see it. I mean, nature is an open book. But what gets the magnesium into the plant is sulfur. If you think about it, you can put gypsum out there. Gypsum is plaster. It's like calcium sulfate. But you put it on out there, and sulfate will react with the magnesium, and magnesium sulfate is Epsom salt. It's really, really soluble, you know? You mix a cup full or two into your bath water and give yourself uh, Epsom salt soak, boy, it's wonderful. It's really helpful. You get magnesium Absolutely. absorbed through your skin and it relaxes the muscles and does wonderful things. So, lot of, lots of people are magnesium deficient, you know. Magnesium deficiency leads to cramps. So you've got cramps maybe you're magnesium deficient. And magnesium is one of those elements that it's rather hard to like draw it up from your digestion because most of the grains that we are eating have phytates in them and they inhibit that process of absorbing the magnesium and the zinc from the food that you eat. Commonly breads are not long ferment breads nor are they sprouted. So you've got phytates that inhibit the digestive process, and then you don't take up those elements. Lots of people are zinc deficient, too, for the same reason. So it's like, but an Epsom salt bath surely helps, I can tell you that. Man, relax you. Before night? Yeah, before you go to bed at night. Just soak in a tub of Epsom salt, you know, warm water with okay. Epsom salts for a half an hour or an hour, and oh boy, it just feels great. So... First time it knocks you away. Huh? First time it knocks you away. So oh, it knocks you, you away? If you never have done it. Oh, you First might... Time you do it. Yeah, you might relax so much you want to go to sleep. Yeah. I think if your head sinks below the surface, it'd wake you up. <laughs> Let's hope so. Okay, so this is the other 5%, and I don't know, but what we need to take a break. Do we need to take a break? What time is it? I talked away here, and I lose track of the time. Hey, Pauja? Okay, so how, how late are we going? Until 5? Uh, well, we know at 4 30. 5? We could go to 5.30. Yeah. I have to get back at the hotel at some point. 4.30, but as far as the two of us are concerned. Oh, so you might have to leave at 4.30. Yeah, leave early. Okay, well. Maybe we can stop at 4.30 and look at the land for half an hour. We could, maybe. Uh, because I can show you things out there that nature is telling you 
that you might not see otherwise. Because you have to have the concept before you will have the perception. We want to read the book. Well, that's good for concepts, but it's not always the best. <laughs>